Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener, your host, Ken Lane, here talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. And finally, the summer is here. The plants that are looking so good right now. Uh, some things that are in bloom. My agaves, or century plants. They call them century plants because in the wild, they bloom about once every 100 years. That's a total myth. That's not true. Uh, mine's a, an, a, a peri agave, or artichoke agave, which looks like a ginormous artichoke. Um, this thing has been in the ground for uh, 15 years, and it is in glorious bloom. In fact, it opened this week, and the the bees are so intoxicated by this this by the flowers, big yellow pads just opening up. The bees are just hundreds of bees are, are you know 10 feet above your head in this huge flower. It's been growing about a foot, more than a foot a week. Uh, t- Two feet a week for the last couple months, and so now it's standing 15 feet tall, maybe more. I don't know. It's so tall you can't, you can hardly reach the the top, the bottom flower, much less the top one. They're starting to open up in yellow, and they are a natural pollinator. Your wild bees. This is a good thing. They love. It's one of their favorite uh, things to pollinate. Are, are agaves, yuccas be another one, but agaves just have sheer mass. They have so many more flowers to pollinate. So they, they're drawn to that yellow uh, and, and the sheer quantity of flowers. And then an agave has tremendous nectar. And so it's just a beautiful plant. When it when it gets done, the main mother plant will die. In fact, mine is starting to show, the bottom pads are starting to show brown. The top is still very green, which means it's going to grow some more. Uh, and then that, then it just dies. What I'm planning on doing with mine is I'm going to harvest that huge, magnificent flower stem. I'm going to cut it off with my sawzall. I'm going to mount it up against the fence or someplace. It's a piece of art. It's just, it's spectacular. I mean, it's just I might even paint it colors. I don't know, spray paint and bring out the colors or keep it looking good. I'll play with do something artistic with it. The mother plant will actually die and then many times you'll see pups or side shoots coming up, little babies coming up. What it will also do is it will send off seed. And this is how it naturally spreads in the wild. You're just out in the Bradshaws or wherever they are out in the wild. Uh, they'll, they'll throw seed off, which go a few feet. But then that huge stem in, the, in nature will actually fall over and just, boom, hit the ground. And then the seed will fall out about 15, 20 feet away over there. And so it just spreads slowly across the native landscape or your backyard. I'm going to probably plant another one just because they're so pretty. They scream they're of the Southwest. I mean, just agaves. There's the Utah gensis, the one that grows up on the rim right there at the canyon. There's a, a, a perii agave or artichoke agave. It grows up on the Bradshaws, up on Mingus. Down towards, I found them in the wild in Kirkland, Skull Valley, those areas. Kind of all over. And then several other varieties. They sort of have a yucca look, which... Red yuccas are also in bloom right now. This is a plant that's standing about, I don't know, four feet tall, maybe five feet tall. Something like big red flowers, uh, just on long stems, multiple flowers coming up, though. Not just one stem. The whole plant has, mine probably has seven or eight flowers coming up in red. Very, very pretty. That one is not going to die when it gets done blooming. Uh, uh, yuccas actually will keep blooming uh, throughout throughout its lifetime for many decades. And so it's more perennial than agave, but it's not as spectacular. Uh, the red flowers are nice. Hummingbirds just love the red flowers of yucca. Also comes in yellow, comes in a rose colored, comes in uh, uh, several different colors, mainly reds and pinks. One yellow variety we've got here at the garden center. And they, they grow up about chest high, just above hip high to chest high, somewhere in there. And they just consistently bloom over and over. When that bloom gets done on your yuccas, you can go ahead and snip those off. Now, that's probably another three months away. They're going to bloom for many months. 
Uh, but this week I was pruning back my spent blooms on my bulbs. I, I pruned back the rest of my iris. So the wild, the uh, uh, native iris to, to, there's a wild Prescott purple, basically is what we call it. Comes up, it's, it's not wild, but it naturalizes so well. It's in a lot of different yards. And then all the exotic varieties of yellows and pinks and whites and variegated. All of those have, have been spectacular this spring. When they're done blooming, they look a little ratty. So I've been cutting back the very last few uh, purple iris I had. I've cut off those those stems. Um, and I'll do the same thing with my uh, red hot poker. Those have just finished out blooming. Uh, this is a sort of looks like a sort of looks like a yucca. I mean kinda, but then it has these stems that come up and it looks like it's a red hot poker, like a like a poker has been in a fire. You pull it out, it's got orange and red flowers that, that hover across it. Animals don't eat it, so so your javelina, your deer and rabbits, they do not like red hot poker. So it just it just naturalizes. It gets bigger and bigger. There's two varieties I've got here at the garden center. One's a tall standard size, this is one you're seeing throughout your neighbor's yard. And they get pretty tall. So four feet tall again, kind of like a yucca. And they make a dwarf variety uh, that only gets up just above knee high. So it's half the size. So less maintenance, same flower, just smaller pint size. Looks great in a container. I mean, it's just really pretty in a container that, you know, the same thing happens with yucca. There's the standard variety that gets up four or five feet. And then there's a dwarf variety. It's called brake light yucca. So it, the, the flower on it is so incredibly red. It's in bloom right now, but it only gets up about knee high again. So we're trying to introduce more and more dwarf varieties or, or less maintenance. Basically they require less pruning, less, they just aren't as aggressive. You plant them and they stay in their place. We're trying to introduce more and more varieties uh, that are dwarfed. They're just Eastern maintained. A butterfly bush in full glorious bloom right now. From your purple night, uh, uh, purple night butter, budlia butterfly bush, uh, it's got a standard purple flower. It gets pretty tall. And this thing can get way taller than you and I. It, it can get, oh, 10 feet tall if you let it go. Most folks trim them back to about chest high. They grow up to about head high throughout the season. Then they'll trim it back again in the, in the winter and keep it down to that hip to chest high. But there's a whole series of butterfly bush. Butterflies, they truly do love butterfly bush. But we're introducing an entire series of dwarf varieties because butterfly bush has been, it's been poo-pooed by a lot of folks. They just don't want it. It's too big, too aggressive, too much maintenance. Even their yard mow and blow guys, they can't keep up with it. It keeps growing. Well, these new dwarf varieties, their ground covers, about a foot tall. They kind of spread. They require virtually no maintenance, and they get the same flower. There's a whole series of yellows and reds and purples and pinks and whites that get up to about hip high or so. Well, that's a really manageable size of summer blooming shrub that just does, does so well. And butterflies truly are drawn to a butterfly bush, from painted ladies to swallowtails. Have you noticed the swallowtails are magnificent their, their 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 population has just exploded this is great news i think the moisture is helping at least at the lane house our gardens we're seeing more butterflies we're seeing hummingbirds i can't count them they're just around and i'm seeing more bees so i think the wild population of bees and butterflies this moisture we had last winter and early spring has really helped them to to grow or maybe it's helped the flowers that they so enjoy to grow so they can keep populating, keep, keep going, and so they, they just thrive. And so we are seeing that the wild bee count is going up. The native, natural, wild-curing beehives, uh, honeybees, are, they're actually healthier than ever. The colonized, the, the ones that, that they take off to farms and populate and pollinate, uh, you know, olives and, and almond and peach fields and... All those, those are actually still declining, and we don't know why. But there's, this is the, our, your natural bees, they are definitely on the increase, and they're loving all the flowers we've got. We've got a lot in store for you this show. But I've got Lisa Watersling coming in with your questions. Don't turn that down. I'll be right back. A lot of good news, good tips for this show. I'll be right back. 
You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. High Waters with the Plants of the Week and our Kaleidoscope Abelia. The longest blooming of shrubs, late spring the entire bush is covered with pink flowers that continue to show off all season. A compact evergreen that is frost, drought, and heat hardy and deer proof. This shrub shines in a kaleidoscope of multicolored foliage that sparkles all the time, all for just $34. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love to garden, they love to shop. Some things are just better together. July is the best time to fertilize with all-purpose plant food from Waters. But pair the all-purpose with humic acid and it's a one-two punch of garden power. Humic acid gives your soil organic matter that helps plants' roots receive water and nutrients. So it makes fertilizer work even better. Like salt and pepper. Coffee and donuts. And hey, you and me. Aw, thanks Ken. All-purpose plant food and humic acid, better together and only at Waters Garden Center. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week and just reiterates or, or shares what are your neighbors talking about what what else is going on in the gardens because quite honestly it doesn't happen in just your yard it happens in your part of the city uh, so whole waves of grasshoppers whole waves of 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 iris will bloom whole wave everything happens all at once and so i think it's valuable to share that so lisa comes in and shares so how's my uh, lake gal recovering uh, from sunburn or from <laughs> soreness or from no i don't get sunburn the floors from from the heat. Heat. Oh yeah, we were up on Lake Powell, we were on a houseboat with the family. So our mm-hmm. kids from Austin came, or they brought right. friends. Our twins came, and mm-hmm. uh, just enjoyed a week on the lake. Yeah, uh, they run about to Rainbow Bridge and Navajo Canyon, all the all the touristy stuff you got to do, <laughs> and then slung them around a little bit on the back of the boat. Uh-huh. It was just a fun time. It was fun. Always fun up there. The water level is definitely rising. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, I think the week they were we were there, they put three links in the dock to yeah. kind of compensate for that. And yeah, lots of wood and debris. Yeah, in well, the it's lake. lots of water coming into the lake <laughs> from the different canyons. So this is a lake that's 150 miles long. I mean, it is way. It goes from Arizona up to Wyoming. I mean, this, this thing goes forever. That lake, the entire lake. It's been going up about seven and a half feet a week. That's, I can't even fathom. That's a lot of water. How much water that is. It's crazy. <laughs> I don't think it'll top out. I think it'll all that snowpack from the Rockies, this side of the Rockies will melt, and then mm-hmm. I think it'll level out at just below the top of the dam. But we, who knows? Who knows? Yeah, how much moisture truly hit the West? Mm-hmm. No one knows. Nobody so. knows. Plus, they let water out of that. True. So. Yeah, that's what goes down to Mead and the rest mm-hmm. of the whole lake system. In the, but yeah. yeah, I'd go back with you. Oh, July. July, let's do that. I didn't, uh, the, the the ground was moving for a little bit. You know, you headed in the bathroom or down the hallway <laughs> and you, you, your, your, your feet kind of move a little bit. A cruise ship will right. do the same thing to you. It did that for, for maybe a day or two and then mm-hmm. it was all good. Yeah, it, it can be disorienting. <laughs> so what kind of questions do we have this week? Well, sure. Our first question is from Dana in Prescott Valley. She's been out of town, too, for oh, a week. Oh, good for you. And when she got back, her wave petunias had tons of little holes oh, no. in the blossoms okay, yeah. and little black dots on the leaves. She wants to know what causes <laughs> that and what can you do for it. So I guess it's out. So I thought I saw an indication of that on our petunias. I love petunias. Mm-hmm. Our, our theme this year is purple, so we have literally, I don't know how many square feet of purple petunias. They're they're unbelievable. But that is a bud leaf, bud worm. That's what that is, a little tiny caterpillar. If you look for him, he'll be up and down the green stems during the day. And then during the morning and evening, he'll come out on the petals, and they just eat the color. They love the color. They love the flowers. They can get on geraniums. Petunias are a favorite. Certain, certain plants, but they love flowers. Right. And so what to do? So I thought I saw some of those before we went up to Lake Powell and went on the houseboat. I'm going, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spray them just just in case. I don't want to come back and no flowers are left. And so I sprayed them with Thuroside 
or uh, the, the old timers would call it BT, mm-hmm. but, but census, th- thuricide, whatever. It's got some fancy Latin name. We just call it BT or thuricide. Um, it's all organic, all natural. And the, the, you spray the foliage or the flowers, and it kills caterpillars, only caterpillars, nothing else. No ladybugs, no praying mantis, just worms, just caterpillars. So it works great on tomato worms, which will be right, I mean, just <laughs> next. I mean, you're going to see those as soon as the budworm shows up. Within a week right. or two, you've got tomato worms coming out, this mm-hmm. huge green uh, worm that eats the foliage off your tomatoes. I would just spray them as a preventative. Or the second you see a hole of any sort in your foliage of your tomatoes or your flowers of your any flower, mm-hmm. just spray them with thuricide, and it will knock them out. They'll just come in and eat it. They get sick. They'll live for a day or two, but then they starve to death and just just die. So if you hit them, it kills them. If they eat it, it kills them. It just keeps product. your flowers clean. That's good amazing. Organic product. It's good for uh, mosquito larvae too, isn't it? I had no idea. You're right. Yeah. That's what they put in the dunks. Mm-hmm. So to mosquito dunks, that's BT or thuricide. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you could easily put that on top of a pond yeah. as a thin layer. It would wipe them right out. Yeah. Absolutely good idea. Ooh, yeah. yeah. All right. Or get a goldfish. <laughs> Or a turtle. Uh, or a turtle. <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> we used to have a turtle. We had turtles in our pond for yeah. years. So. Never did find out what happened to him. Now our frog disappeared. I think he left. I miss my frog. I think he was afraid of all the fireworks or something. I don't know. But he was uh, there two nights ago. Was he? But he's starting to roam. I think he's been uh, calling for a mate and he she or he... Him. Better Ain't pack coming. his bags and yeah. go. <laughs> Better go roaming around the countryside. Where's the next pond? <laughs> Far and few between. <laughs> He's yeah. driving us. Our, our, we like him. Yeah. Of course, we raised our family in Skull Valley right there on Kirkland Creek. And so toads and frogs mm-hmm. are thick. So in the summer, they would just have this chorus. It's a right. beautiful chorus. So we like frogs. We've learned to tune them in and yeah. appreciate them. But our neighbors have not done that. So you're kind of, uh, <laughs> what is that? And how do I get rid of it? I know. I'm like, it, just enjoy it while it's there. It's, it's called nature. Right. Yeah. Uh, so Jeff has a question. He heard you talking about thinning the fruit on apple trees. Right. Wants to know, is that true of all fruit trees? And is it too late to do it now? It's never too late. So I, I would say apples, pears, Peaches are the most common ones. Uh, maybe nectarines uh, are the most common. And what they'll do is they'll force flowers. And so you have pods of flowers, so groupings of five, six, seven, eight. I mean, fruit, flowers, pollinate. All of them will start forming a fruit. And all of a sudden, all the, there's only a certain amount of energy coming up through that stem or that branch. And it either goes to all those fruits or it goes all into one large fruit or two large fruits. So really, you do want to thin off all but maybe a cut one or two uh, fruits. And this is a good time to do it because you can see which ones are the strongest. It's kind of like a nest of baby birds or something. Mm-hmm. Certain ones are just really strong. They really they get most of the food from mom and dad. Well, they're kind of like that. So there's the runt of the litter. You want to pick those off and then feed the ones that are stronger and leave those on. Okay. If they're damaged... Pick it off. If they're rubbing raw, rubbing different, or they're deformed, pull them off. Keep the strongest, most perfect, largest fruits. And all the rest of that energy will go into that fruit. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's good for all fruits, except some just aren't worth the I mean, cherries. I mean, you just, how are you even begin? Or just just let them load up and forget it. Yeah. Um, Apricots can be that way a little Mm -hmm. bit sometimes. But all the other fruits, I mean, figs, you keep those on. Berries, blackberries, raspberries, boysenberries, those are, you keep those all on. But the, the f- trees that put a fruit, yeah. those are ones that benefit most. Uh, plums, mm-hmm. they're notorious for having hundreds of plums and all pits, mm-hmm. tiny little fruits and pits. So thin them. Just yeah. really be aggressive. I mean, really, I'd start by shaking the tree and see what drops because you know those are weak and then go after the rest of them that you can reach. It's better for the tree, too, because then you don't get such heavy branches that you end up breaking on your branches. So hard to do, but you need to do it. Do it. Right. Okay. Next question is from Gary. He would like to put in grapes and berry plants. Wants to know what their needs are. Full sun? Do they need some shade? 
Um, and is it too late to put them in? Oh, absolutely not too late. In fact, this is an ideal time. It's right before the monsoons. But they're, they're over in New Mexico, so it's about to hit us. So it would be two, three weeks. The rains will come, and then your berries and your grapes will just thrive on that. It's just a tremendous time to put in your edibles. Really, to be planting, that, that monsoon season is almost like a second planting season. That rainy season cools it off, it raises the humidity, and then it filters from the sun. So it's just a really good time, but especially for your brambles and your grapes. So go for it. So blackberries, heavy producers, raspberries, heavy producers, uh, all the grape varieties from wine vineyard grapes to table grapes, this is grape country. It does really well, especially if you've got heavy clay soils. That can, it really adapts well. Mm -hmm. Sun. They do need a rich soil, so mend them heavily, and then give them at least, I would say, six hours of sun or more. More sun equals more fruit. Mm -hmm. So it's, it can go right out in full sun, Prescott Valley, Paulden, full sun, wind exposed on the top of the ridge lines of Prescott, I mean, just exposed. They'll thrive. If you, if you irrigate them, treat them like a tree or a shrub, and that's water them once or twice a week and fertilize them a few times a year, and you will have more fruit you know what to do with. Great questions this week, folks. Be right back with more with Annalisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. You're listening to Ken Lane, a.k.a. the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. Gee, my flowers just bloom too much. Said no one, ever. Hi, this is Kenneth Waters. We had a crazy winter and everyone's ready for flowers in the garden. Waters Flower Power is made specifically for Arizona that gives flowers that extra boost to burst into bloom. It's an energy kick in the plants. Get ready for roses that rule, peppers that pop, and tomatoes that triumph. More power to the flowers with Flower Power at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. High Waters with the Plants of the Week and our summer love, Agastache. A perennial that happily shrugs off summer heat in waves of tubular red flowers. Exceptional heat tolerance, this hummingbird perennial draws pollinators close into the garden. The minty fragrance keeps javelina, deer, and rabbits away, and these huge plants are just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love summer flowers, they love to shop. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. We had gone off for a vacation trip, took a week off, uh, needed it after the spring season. And then uh, we have a lot of container gardens. And the container gardens, they are on their own drip system. We've got a separate valve just for the pots in the front and the back and the in-ground. I've got in-ground pots, above-ground, you know, glazed, beautiful containers, and in the back, the same thing. So my tomatoes, peppers... Lots of flowers, trees, all kinds of things are grown. In, and we have over 50 containers with gardens. These are lush, like like the, just lush gardens in containers. Drip irrigation is our secret. But here's another insider tip if you're traveling. And this is how all of our, our flowers came through except for one. And I'll tell you how we lost it. Uh, but we put some saucers underneath our containers, even large containers. We'll put a saucer underneath. And so we'll run the drip irrigation until the water goes through the entire root zone and then comes out and fills that saucer underneath. And that is a magic bullet for, for container gardens in the summer heat. These are full-on exposed kind of, uh, most of them are just full hot sun on patios. So it's radiant heat. But that saucer idea, what it does is you, if you'll take your soil right down to the bottom of the pot, and that water goes through all that soil band and then comes out the bottom, that drip hole in the bottom, fills up the saucer. It, the plants will wick that water back up into the soil as they need it. So it takes the edge off of plants that maybe might struggle. So if you're struggling to keep things moist, that's an insider tip that really, really helps. Uh, so we've, we've, most of our, our containers, except for the very largest ones, have a saucer underneath them, mainly just in the summer. 
This is when we're traveling. This is when the water, the irrigation really gets a workout. That's a little insider tip. You can go buy a self-watering pot or you can make your own by just throwing a saucer underneath it. And it's got a lip of about a foot, uh, an inch or so. And that's good enough. The plants will absorb that. What you don't want to do is put something in the bottom of that pot. Let's say styrofoam peanuts, Coke cans, water bottles. You'll hear all kinds of stuff. You know, take, fill the pot up halfway with, plastic water bottles, and then the rest with soil. Water will not wick that way. So you've got to have soil through the entire pot, potting soil, a good organic potting soil. And then as the water needs to be drawn back up to the root system of those plants, it'll go through the soil. It won't go through styrofoam peanuts or different soil change or that kind of, it needs to be consistent. So that little secret will probably save your plants or get you more flowers Especially if you're traveling, if you do a lot of RVing or cruising, or just, you just you, you want your plants to look good when you get back, that worked. Now, the reason that one of our plants died, we had bought it right before we came in. We're okay. We're good gardeners. Sometimes we get a little cocky. And we saw this great new plant that came in right before we left, so I grabbed one and uh, and put it on a drip system. But the pot, the plant was so large for the pot, we must have gotten windy, and so the drip came on but the pot had fallen over and so none of the water went in so it just it just toasted it can't go a week without water i don't care how tough it is and so it just roasted that's how we lost the one plant out of 50 in our yard it's now been replaced with something even better because we got some new flowers in but that's that's an insider tip that'll really help you uh, also I just planted some rosemary to trail over the front edge of our raised gardens. We've got lots of stair-stepped gardens. We're on a classic mountain hillside. We're taking a retaining block, and every so many feet, we have another raised bed that just kind of steps down. Well, it can look a little like too much hardware, look too much block. And so I try to have some trailing things that are tough at the front edge, not flowering things like a shrub. Then I put it on my tree and shrub uh, system, not the not the container garden uh, system, and so it gets watered twice a week. Maybe maybe not even that. Probably more like every five days. So I put some rosemary, trailing rosemary at the front edge, and it looks amazing. It's evergreen. You can cook with it, although those I don't really cook with. I've got some bigger shrubs that I actually go and harvest if I need it. Uh, but the trailing ones they bloom starting in March. They're a pollinator for the traveling butterflies and bees as they migrate back and forth. They, they, they wake up really hungry in March. There's not much blooming, so rosemary does. And then it blooms a long time. I mainly like it because it's evergreen. So in the winter, I can look out, and it, it just looks good. And it takes our summer heat, takes our winter snow and, and cold. It takes our summer heat, at least in the mountains of Arizona it does. If you get the certain varieties, for me... I used Huntington Carpet Trailing Rosemary. There's upright shrubs, but this is a, this is a variety that, that just prostrate. It grows right next to the ground. Not all rosemary are rated the same in the mountains. Some of them are kind of, they, they, they fade out in the winter mainly. So they're made for more of the desert areas down there. But up here, we need more robust varieties. So it's going to be ARP, A-R-P, or Huntington Carpet. These are varieties that love the altitude, love the cold, takes whatever swings we have, will take our summer heat. That's a little tip that'll really, if you get if you get too much going on in some raised beds, you want to soften that lip or the edge, that's one that instantly makes it look better. Be right back with more on The Mountain Gardener. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our Cabernet Sauvignon Grape Vines. One of the most widely recognized wine grapes producing tasty red fruits and superior wine. Yes, you can grow your own and it doesn't take as many vines as you might think. Used to arch a walkway or shade a terrace all for under $20. The grape harvest is simply a bonus. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love to make their own wine, they love to shop. Hi, Lisa with the finds of the week and our Forester Feathergrass. 
Dramatic bronze flower spikes start blooming in early summer and don't stop until well into next year. The flowers are so light and airy it's often referred to as feather grass. Growing to just hip high, this dainty grass shows off enough to make a designer statement without being invasive. All for under $30. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love really pretty grass, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert, Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding. With a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts, sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are back in the studio with Lisa Waters Lane, just getting her take on local gardening. Welcome back into the studio, Lisa. Thank you. So uh, we should have, we've got some good news we got last week. Our boy made it back from a tour uh, deployment to mm-hmm. South Korea. He made it back to his home base, yeah. Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. So mm-hmm. haven't seen him yet. Can't wait to see him. We'll see him in a couple weeks. Right. But uh, we're darn proud of him. I don't know how you service men and women have done it. I mean, just a nine-month deployment away from your family in a foreign place, holding down the peace. I mean, tr- truly... Our freedom depends on you and how you just go off that long. I mean, corporate America, you go off for two weeks, come back on the weekend, you know, that. <laughs> yeah. the, the, and you stay in a nice hotel. You stay in a nice hotel. You stay at a base with the whatever. So yeah. our boy is a first lieutenant mm-hmm. with, he's a physician's assistant for the First Armored Division, their engineering group or something. I can't keep track. The titles are beyond me. and <laughs> I can barely get, get the rank right. But deep respect after seeing... Yeah. Uh, what what our boys done? I was talking to a guy that was working on our generator in the houseboat. He did twenty four years in the Coast Guard. Wow! He has stories. I mean, he could go out. He's taking care of one hundred and thirty four foot cruisers. I mean, just these big things that roam up and down the coast. He's going. Oh yeah, I'd go off on training missions for you know, nine months at a time. I did that for four years straight. I'm going. How did you do that? And keep a family? I'm going. Well, we finally decided to retire. He moved to. To uh, uh, Page, mm-hmm. where his wife is from, and then he just works on houseboats. He's going, yeah, I'm looking at this generator. It's like a lawnmower. I'm used to working on <laughs> huge diesel, multi-turbo. He's describing this thing. Going, yeah. Whoa. You just went above my head. Mm-hmm. I sell manure for a living. I mean, that's kind of how I get by. <laughs> anyway. But yeah, the, the people that go off, and then the families that stay behind. It's, it's hard on them, too. Yeah. We, uh, our daughter-in-law had three kids under eight under seven to, yeah and an infant under one yeah. so you know it's rough but, but they do it uh the infant our our emily rose she took her first step last she week did. while james was at home so he landed she started walking yeah. so that was just like that that's that awesome i love seeing the pictures i do too yeah so anyways enough about us never <laughs> stop it <laughs> So Let's talk about us, our dog now. Our gardens, <laughs> our garden center, our dogs, our kids. It is oh, our show. Oh, they're like, what are they going to shut up? <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, so we were gone. It was hot. We got back. And actually, all we had one casualty, but all of our pots and flowers looked really, really good. It did. It looked yeah. amazing. So it's definitely hot now. So I thought we would talk about those annuals. Annuals are those plants that give everything they got for one season, then they're done. Um, that really, really like the heat um, because not all of them do. You could. Good point. Yeah. Okay. So the first one I picked is Pintas, P E N T A S. Uh, just a really cool flower. Probably gets maybe a foot tall, a little bit taller, maybe. Um, but. Truly a butterfly magnet. Butterflies love it. The flowers are kind of like a landing pad type flower. My favorite one is called red velvet. That's neat. Just because that red is just so dynamic and just stands out. Uh, but it also comes in pinks and lavenders and purples and white and all those different colors. But it really, really is a good heat tolerant plant. Thrives in above 80, 90 degrees. Mm-hmm. Just thrives. The hotter it gets, the more it blooms. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Definitely happy with that. The annual vinca is another one that um, is tough as nails. My favorite one is the apricot, Cora apricot. It has kind of a lightish, pinkish, peachy flower, but the center is like a real dark purple to it. Very, very pretty. You should describe for the East Coast Midwest folks 
Vinca, because some of those, they melt out in the humidity over mm-hmm. there. Yeah. They're kind of disease prone, but we came right. out with a new variety called Cora Vinca, mm-hmm. C-O-R-A. Cora Vinca it is not, doesn't get diseases. I mean, no. budworm doesn't go after that. I mean, it has no natural... And animals I mean, don't They leave them alone. It. It's crazy. Yeah. And they bloom better than ever in the summer. So mm-hmm. so the Cora Vinca, go for that one specific, right. especially if you've had trouble in the past. Mm-hmm. It really adapts well to the mountains of Arizona. It does. The only way you can kill it is if you overwater it. That's true. It, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. will melt down. The other thing I like about the Vinca is it has the upright one, which gets about a foot tall, but it also has a cascading one, which is really nice to put over those pots Put in your pots and kind of soften the edge. Um, so terrific for that. So upright and cascading. And fresh plant. I mean, I, we came back from, from mm-hmm. vacation, and, and the greenhouses are packed with color. I mean, it's not like oh, it's yeah. too late or the oh, we're out yeah. of growing season, or can I plant this now? I'm going, no, this is like we're coming into our next planting season. The, mm-hmm. the monsoonal rains will come. Yeah. And so it just we just we need Phoenix to get really hot. <laughs> Not and us. as soon as that happens, the rain that draws the moisture in, mm-hmm. just like a vacuum, it pulls it pulls it right yeah. in. So you'll get rains every afternoon. Sure. So pray that you know that your friends out in Phoenix just roast, not us, <laughs> just them, and then then the rains will come. It's I'm yeah. looking at like two weeks out maybe. And it doesn't hurt to. Re- I went through and replaced quite a few plants, even though our containers looked good. There were some that just kind of looked a little, I don't know, didn't like them, didn't like the color, didn't like the way it was performing. I'm going to try something else in there. Of course, I'm think, always doing that. I think you were bored. No. Because <laughs> they looked fantastic. They they needed a little more color to them. So I went through okay. and put some other plants in. Uh, Lantana does very well in the heat. If, you know, if you've got a rock yard with nothing but heat, beaten down on you lantana's one to throw in there my favorite one is the uh lucky hot pink it's just oh. pink pink but it also like has a little bit of orange or something bubble gum pink or, or yeah orangey yeah, just a Have real great gum. pink That's but it also has it's like a variegated blossom almost yeah. very pretty kufia is another great one uh, some people know it by mexican heathers another name comes in lavenders and white it's also very, very animal resistant. So if you've got javelina, bunnies, deer, it's a great one to put in. Uh, nice little spreader. It doesn't get overly tall, but it spreads nicely for you. It's pretty. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. ha- it looks delicate. Right. But it is, like you said, it's, it's the Mexican heather. It's like mm-hmm. it looks like a heather kind of flower, but just keep mounds and keeps spreading and comes in bright colors. Great choice for summer. Mm-hmm. The other plant that I'm really, really liking this year is the Sun Believable Sunflower. And I know we've kind of talked about it a little bit, but new introductions, you're always kind of... I don't know. We'll try it. Uh, but it's proving its metal out there in the heat. And it truly is bloom after bloom after bloom. And you know, most true sunflowers, you get some blooms on it. It's really pretty when it's in bloom. And then it kind of goes out and you're like, ooh, that's pretty ugly. <laughs> the sun believable has really it has kept blooming. We need a new one at home, by the way, because your puppy dog. My puppy dog. Yes. <laughs> Callie. Uh, Really? Eight hour sunflower. How'd she even reach it? She, I mean, it's right there. At the, she jumped up a step. She's now tall enough to jump up a step. <laughs> and went over to that bed and just chewed it. So it's all broken down. Oh. It just, it, I think it'll come back. But I'm not waiting for a season for no. it to come back. I just put a new one in and call it all good. And yeah. then I'll put an electric <gasps> fence on it or something. To, no, You're not terrible. Kidding. Not kidding. <laughs> so, a little miniature schnauzers. In teething stage. So. Yes, she is in the teething stage. <laughs> but fortunately, she has little tiny, little, tiny teeth. teeth. <laughs> Perfect for stems of sunflowers. <laughs> anyway. um, the other one that I really am happy with is the Calabricoa, which I think it used to be called Million Bells. I don't know why they changed it. Maybe that was a trademark name. But Calabricoa, the little tiny petunia type flowers, multitudes of colors. Um, that's the other one I kind of went back through when we got back home, and I put more of those in some of the pots yeah. because I know you kind of wanted that purple theme, but you need something to offset that purple. What's wrong with purple? <laughs> There's a little bit of gold in there. You needed okay. a little more yeah, agree. bright pinks and reds. and that Million kind of Bells stuff. is a petunia. 
only it's smaller, and then it makes up. It has it's half the size, but it puts on three times the volume of flowers. So overall, you get more flowers in a petunia, and then it trails. It just has these long tendrils that run down mm-hmm. the edge, front edge of pots, containers, that kind of yep. stuff. So great for hanging baskets. Sure. Thank you, Lisa. Great tips, and there's I'm sure there's more because it looks like there the list is keeps more. going. Mm-hmm. But you're out of time, I, honey. We'll my be life. back. You have to come back. Next week, and listen okay. in to Lisa and her your garden tips. But for now, you're listening to Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Hi, Waters with the plant of the week and our red cobweb hens and chicks. Tiny rosettes are covered with crazy cobweb-like hairs, then open and spread to make a dense, succulent ground cover. This drought-loving perennial flushes red in the spring with cactus pink flowers in the summer. Perfect for planting in rock gardens, super attractive in containers, and just $14. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love crazy new succulents, they love to shop. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Goshiki Holly. Goshiki translates from Japanese as holly with five colors. Its new leaves emerge red, then turn green. The entire top of this holly is draped in colors of cream, white, gray, yellow, and green. This evergreen makes the perfect accent, hedge, or evergreen container for its all-round good looks. A really nice plant that shines through winter is just $39. Waters Garden Center, where people who love Japanese gardens, they love to shop. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. Now there's certain parts of garden tasks you really need to be diligent. and There's certain seasons you need to be more focused than others. In the winter, you kind of sit around and sip iced tea and you do a little pruning as it's a sunny day and just really relax. Now, you really be, need to be on the game. And here's the main thing you need to watch for. Bugs. Bugs and disease. So we're seeing lots of indication of powdery mildew showing up on roses, chitalpas, all kinds of things. So there's this white, the leaves should be bright green and it's, it's got this white hue to it. That is one thing and one thing only, powdery mildew. And it's a spore that gets in and just starts sucking out the sugars of that leaf till finally it yellows, drops off, and dies. It can actually kill plants, but it, it's got certain flavors that they really like. So you really like things with a glossy, smooth leaf to it. So that would be things like roses is one of them. Uh, trees like chitalpa gets on that more than desert willow, although they're cousins of each other. Why it loves the one and not the other, I don't know. But you should walk your yard and look for leaves that are look off color. If they're starting to yellow and they're dropping, that's usually an indication it's stressed, something's wrong. You should take a closer look. It can quite obviously be powdery mildew. That's the number one thing as we start getting into the monsoon pattern. And it will only, uh, it, it, it just grows exponentially as the rains come. So it starts now and then it just gets worse through August. Don't let it go. It's an easy solution. There's a natural or organic solution called revitalize. It's a, it's a new spray out that's all, it's this chemistry they're coming out with, not chemistry, the organistry, or what do you call organics? Anyway, it's an organic s- solution to powdery mildew, but you want to catch it early. You don't want to wait until the whole thing is white and you're almost reacting to things. You put revitalize on mine. Now, my chitalpa, it's in full bloom. It's a tree that's been in about 10 years. It's up about 15 feet tall, rounded shape, covered in pink flowers. You folks in the valley areas are famous for your ch- ch- chitalpas in commercial settings and backyards. It's just a great, easy care, drought-hardy tree. But mine gets powdery mildew every year. I just know it's coming, so I'm going to spray mine with Revitalize before it even starts. I just know it's going to happen. I'm going to spray it now, and I'll probably follow up when the rains come, whenever that, end of July, 1st of August, and that should get rid or mitigate any powdery mildew issues. So if you've got roses, you just know if had some issues, just spray them now. 
preventative. Get on it now. The other one is you're seeing uh, grasshoppers. The hatch has happened, and they're going to grow, and they're going to grow fast. They're going to eat everything in their sight, and the ground literally will move because there's so many of them. If you're on an, on a property where you just have some grasshopper influx, you've had problems in the past, you're next to a grass field, you've got large properties around you, your neighbors just let the weeds grow. They aren't, they aren't the most tidy people. So grasshoppers tend to gather in those areas as a preventative. Start now. Start early. Uh, put down no-low bait, N-O-L-O, completely organic. Very specialized. You're probably going to have to go to a garden center to get it. Even then, you probably come to Waters. We've got it. You're probably you're you're. This is broadcast all over northern Arizona, but just so specialized. Your garden centers will have it. So Nolo N O L O. It's it's wheat laced with a virus that they are allergic to, and so they stop eating right away, and then they'll die from starvation in about I don't know two or three days. And then this, the, the virus spreads throughout the, the colony or the population of the grasshoppers. Only goes after grasshoppers, purely grasshoppers. If you've got that, get on it early because they are going to be bad. I mean, we're seeing a, an uptick in butterflies. There's more butterflies than usual. There's more bees than usual. There's going to be more grasshoppers and more blister beetles and more aphids and more. There's going to be more because that moisture we had earlier is going to play out as what I think is. Uh, the the junipers, the native things that they naturally are used to are happier than ever. The bloom count is better. It's just the forest is happy. So that makes there's more for the bugs to eat. They, they see that. It's kind of a, a domino effect. So they'll also put pressure on your backyard gardens. So so keep on. I'm a really, it's, it's worth walking the yard and just taking a close look. If in doubt, come to the garden center. We've got a microscope. We'll blow it up. We'll show you what it is. If you're not sure, you can't quite see it. You know, your cheaters are out there and you still, even with a flashlight, and you still can't quite tell. We'll blow it up to 300 times its natural size and go, here, yeah, that is, that's what that is. That's a flea beetle. Look at that. That's why your leaves are going yellow. Put it in a little plastic baggie. Ziploc if you can. So that way they can't escape on your ride here to the garden center. We'll put it underneath the microscope. We could tell you, this is a look at this. Someone shot me a... A leaf gall of all things, really funky, weird thing. Had to look like a alien, foreign thing landing on the back of their leaf. Going, yeah, that's a gall. No worries. Don't worry about it. It's it's. I, here's a spray if you need to can't keep it from spreading, but it's not really dangerous. But flea beetles, those are dangerous. Blister beetles, dangerous. Grasshoppers, they can obliterate your gardens. Certain things are more dangerous than others, and we can show you how to keep it organic when they show up. Something else I'm going to do in the next probably 10 days before the rains come. So my gardens are spectacular. The grapes are, are phenomenal. The berries are starting to fruit. Tomatoes, I picked my first one. We're picking squash. The flowers are over the top. Uh, the evergreens are just stunning, vibrant green. But all the food that I put on those plants back in February and March, they've used all that food. I've been watering. Uh, so things have flushed out. And so if you fertilize right before the monsoon rains, you can have a whole other set of flush of growth on uh, Coreopterus and, and butterfly bush, and autumn sage, and Russian sage, and roses. Uh, you can get more growth out of that shade tree that's maybe a little undersized yet. It's, it's important to fertilize right as the monsoon rains hit. And here's, here's why. Uh, we don't have any naturally occurring food in our soil. This is a this is a this is something you Midwesterners cannot wrap your brain around. You're used to eight foot topsoils and and rich soils that you've never fertilized in your life. Well, we don't have that here. We've got no soil, and the little bit that was there, a few millimeters, they've scraped it off and pushed it aside. Then they put rock down and plastic on top of that, more rock, and then they plugged a tree in the middle of your yard and. Your plants will literally starve to death here. It's uniquely southwestern. And so we just don't have enough moisture. It's actually it's an altitude issue, too. We'll have our rains come, and, and it comes in a torrent. So these monsoonal rains will come, and they flush all of our nutrients downstream. So you have this beautiful, like we raised our family on the, on the, the base of Kirkland Creek down in Skull Valley. 
lush bottomland. But all that lush soil had come from the hillsides surrounding Skull Valley, and we got the benefit of all that nutrient got washed down the monsoons, and so it was great farming. Well, if you're on a hilltop, you have none. All that rain comes and flushes all that nutrient downstream. So you're left with starving plants. They yellow. They don't bloom very well. If your lilacs did not bloom this spring like they should have, you need to fertilize. Not just now, but again in the fall of the year. If your fruit trees just are anemic, they just didn't fruit it. They just aren't, they aren't producing like they did in the past. That's a nutrient issue almost always. If your flowers just aren't blooming like your neighbors, that's always a nutrient issue. Everyone wants to blame it on water. Water's almost the culprit. It flushes all that nutrient out, and so you're left with plants that are starving. You need to re re up that. So I made a fertilizer here for the mountains of Arizona. It's called All Purpose Plant Food 744. The main ingredients are cottonseed meal and bird guano and some iron and sulfur and some things. Very safe, very natural. And the great thing about natural foods is they break down very slowly over a very long period of time. So you get a benefit that way. I put down with mine humic acid with my fertilizer. Uh, the humic acid lowers the pH, helps the plants to root deeper, open up their pores so they can take in more of the nutrients. So I get a, I get a, a harvest like you've never seen. I get flowers that are over the top, and that's how I do it. I put humic acid. It's granular. Uh, and then I also put down food, all-purpose food. I put those things down right before the monsoons. And watch out. You're going to have thick, lush trees, beautiful, thick evergreens. You're going to have fruit trees that just do well. I mean, it's just do everything with that with that tooth, one two punch. Humic acid, all-purpose food, and you will have a lush yard. Especially if you've got a new yard, new landscape, new everything's new. Oh, it's really important. Be back with more. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Hi, Waters with the plants of the week and our gold flame honeysuckle. Wonderfully fragrant. These blooms are in full color right now and will stay that way until the first frost of October. These pink and gold blooms are irresistible to hummingbirds and butterflies alike. Excellent as a quick ground cover, but robust enough to climb vertical structures and fences, all for under $37. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love blooming vines, they love to shop. Wondering why my garden looks amazing? Well, that's personal. The personal garden shopper service at Waters Garden Center, that is. Before talking with my personal shopper, I had no idea which plants would be best for me. But now my garden is bursting with flowers and buzzing with hummingbirds. Just go to watersgardencenter.com, click on Shop, and choose Personal Garden Shopper. A Waters Garden expert will pick the perfect plants for you, personally. The Personal Garden Shopper, only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert, Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. I do have a huge, huge shout out to uh, Frontier Rotary, Prescott Frontier Rotary. This is a service club that's of business folks and community leaders that get together. They try to make their community, their world, a better place. Well, I gave them the garden center last Sunday, and they had a fundraiser called Grapes for Grades. And so they're, they were raising money. So Frontier Rotary has a summer math and reading clinic, and they try to fund that with this one event, and they did phenomenally. The reason I've got such a large thank you is I had scheduled them last year to come in, but then I also had some time on a houseboat with kids coming in, and, and uh, I didn't I didn't do my schedule very well. Uh, I should have run that through my assistants or my wife or something. I just scheduled it. So we've got vacation time and grapes for grades, major event at the garden center. Uh, I wasn't there. The first time in 14 years I'd missed a grapes for grades event. It's a fundraiser. We are I'm, I'm a Rotarian. I gave our place. I feel responsible for it. I really want it to do well. And so I asked my staff, would they be willing to cover for me? Would they take my place? That is, it's a, it's a logistical nightmare. I mean, all these 300 
plus people show up at your garden center, your 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 living room. You kind of want your your neighbors to take care of it for you. They, they, they no, the staff stepped up and just did amazing. I'm so proud of you all. Yeah, the cleanup, the the parking, the the flow through, the just everything was so well. And to Prescott Frontier Rotary, I, I made all the phone calls to you know the, 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 the Steve Shishkas. Sanford Cohen's, Michael Payson's, of the folk, the chairmen's, just going, hey, I know you're the auctioneer. Would you mind if I missed? Is that okay? Just to make sure they were okay with me being gone. So uh, Steve Shishka was our MC. Thank you, Steve, for just covering for me. I felt comfortable having two friends up there on stage making me look good, making the store look good, making the club look good, making my staff feel comfortable. Uh, but thank you for the, the to the club and to... Front, Frontier Rotary and, and to the staff, really, really my staff. You guys are awesome. Pleasure working with you. Thank for thank you for being family enough to go. We got this, Ken. Go enjoy your family. So with that, I'll cover with that. Just enough of thank you. Classes. We should cover that. Garden classes happen every every weekend. We've got a free garden class, and so we make that so that you become better gardeners. It's it's uniquely different here. This, it's not like anywhere else in the country. The Southwest is not like anywhere else in the country. And so we put together free garden classes to help folks up their game so they, they're making less mistakes. So this weekend was blooms at – flowers that just bloom in summer. Bloom like crazy. What, if you need more color, that's it. Next week, July 12th, it's Friday at 3.30, it's juicier fruits, berries, and grapes. So how do you grow edible shrubs basically and we'll probably cover some trees as well july 20th that's a saturday at 9 30 in the morning it's easy grow roses this part of the country the mountains of arizona grow better roses than anywhere else in the country i mean with easier care we have less issues with mildews and bugs just they love the sun they love the altitude they bloom better they bloom longer uh, roses do well we're going to go over how to make them bloom and which varieties do best then july 27th it's flowers that impress the perennials that come back year after year. What are those? And so we go deep into all those, and it keeps going. Take a look at the entire class schedule there at watersgardencenter.com. Right in the very front, you'll see a classes button They're right there. For Facebook folks, you know where to go. So Facebook forward slash Waters Garden Center, the same thing, and under events. So Facebook does a little different. They go events. Here they are all listed. You can see where they are. The time frames are always free. Come in, bring a friend, bring a chair, bring some donuts. If I'm speaking, a cup of coffee. I like cappuccinos. And you'll get preferred treatment. <laughs> I'll answer all of your questions. Anyway, no, we've got guest speakers that come in. Take a look. Throughout the week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center, and we love talking to fans of the show. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Pink Volcano Phlox. Just when spring flowers are fading, these beauties revive and show off. Your grandmother only dreamed of growing a pretty pink phlox this fine. Each flower cluster could make a bridal bouquet all by itself. This new volcano series is erupting with flowers used to accent entries and fountains, all for $15. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love eruptions of pink flowers, they love to shop. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our Lavender Chiffon Hibiscus. This hardy variety is one of the longest blooming, most prolific shrubs showing off massive four inch lavender flowers all summer long. This stately bush likes to show off and all for $39. But wait, there's more. These pretty shrubs come back again next year with even more stunning beauty. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love stunning hibiscus, they love to shop. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.